Today we are talking about two different papers, one from quantum computing and one from classical machine learning, which are both, I think, overly ambitious in their, uh, at the very least, in their titling. Uh, we will talk more about the rest of it uh, shortly, but I normally don't really um, comment on papers or try to critique them uh, because I'm I think it's very, you know, it's important to have a collaborative sort of uh, effort in, in, in this. And, you know, I don't really, I don't want to critique other people's papers, you know, in some sort of public fashion. I don't want other people to, you know, critique mine. But I think these have sort of um, risen above sort of the standard in the sense that everyone's talking about them. And I think uh, they are titled in such a way to attract that attention. Uh, for example, the first algorithm or the first uh, paper we see is Grover's algorithm offers no quantum advantage, um, which is a huge, that's a, that's a, that's a title that people will click on. Um, I will give you that, but also that is a huge deal, uh, to see if that was the case, because Grover's algorithm is one of the most foundational sort of introductory algorithms of quantum computing and I've done videos on it in the past and I think that this would be very interesting to a lot of people and it was I think a better um, title for this paper might be something like a classical MPS algorithm for certain three sat um, problems or something like that but uh I'll talk about that later as well, but basically this paper obviously is literally titled Grover's algorithm offers no quantum advantage. So what's it going to say? It's going to tell us in this paper why Grover's algorithm, which has been <laughs> extensively studied to say the least, does not in fact offer a, uh, a advantage. And part of the reason I think this isn't like Normally, right, if, if I just wrote a paper, Shor's algorithm offers no quantum advantage, people would be like, what the hell are you talking about? But there is a common thing uh, with or Grover's algorithm and or auricular algorithms more generally that is very, like, uh, sometimes when you're working with an oracle and, like, a complexity description, it's very confusing and separated from the practical sort of implementations that it's that's like a, a really common question I, I've had before is like what what really is this oracle but it's important to recognize that when we're talking about advantages and complexity we're not talking about a circuit we're not talking about gates we're talking about functions here the oracle is a function that it operates on some states uh, and that's it that that is what the um the function is. So without further ado, let's get into the paper. I'm not going to really be walking through it. What I'm going to sort of be going over is that the argument here is that Grover's algorithm can be efficiently simulated by a classical computer, basically. Um, and uh, basically because certain types of oracles can be represented efficiently as MPS or matrix product states, which is something that tensor um, tensor networks and those sort of techniques are really good at simulating up to huge numbers of qubits. Uh, but we can already see from the get-go that this isn't really correct. So Grover, the title Grover's algorithm offers no quantum advantage. Quantum advantage like does isn't a universal thing. If I have an algorithm that provides quantum advantage, such as Grover's algorithm, that doesn't mean it's impossible for someone to construct a problem that is more efficient to be solved on a classical computer. Otherwise, <laughs> there is no quantum advantage for any problem in, in that case, because I can always make some sort of weird counterexample or almost always do that. Like there are definitely problems in which Grover's algorithm would perform worse than some sort of classical fancy algorithm. But the problem is that in general is what we're looking at, sort of the asymptotic performance. And we can see that already from figure one is that we can see, okay, here's the Oracle, um, is the entanglement. So like, is there, uh, not a lot of entanglement, uh, 
or I guess is the entanglement period. So there's not a lot of entanglement. We can do it very quickly. There is some entanglement. So uh, if it's less than 80, basically we can solve it on a classical computer or supercomputer. If it's not less than 80, we cannot, or we would have to do this um, uh, not on a supercomputer, but also running a problem on a quantum computer would take a lot of time anyway. Uh, so you can sort of see right away that this is a practical uh, concern, right? Like uh, not not a theoretical one. Running a problem would take an astronomical amount of time. Astronom that's not a complexity class, <laughs> okay? Um, if the problem right scales square root, remember Grover's algorithm gives a square root advantage uh, over uh, sort of classical problems and it's exponentially scaling. Okay, yeah, if it's it's gonna take an astronomical amount of time on big problems, but is it faster than the astronomical amount of time it would take on a classical computer? Like that's the question we're after here is not practically what's the you know implications. This is you know the, the actual complexity here. And so as we get further into the paper, you'll notice just some details on basically what they're uh, working on. So we have our typical Grover problem, which is fine. Um, and this, this is where we can see that this is uh, what's going on and how they're able to make this claim, which is not entirely correct. So if we have this, um, you know, uh, set of two to the n bit strings, then we want to find basically this, we're doing some sort of quantum search to find this one value, this one bit string. And we have an oracle, i.e. a function that can uh, tell us this, like we can query this function basically. Um, but that's all we know. And in fact, if you go to the original Grover's algorithm paper, oh, spoiler alert for the next one, um, which I have up and I will of course link in the description. Grover's algorithm is uh, section two of the paper states, the abstracted problem. Let a system have n equals two to the n states which are labeled S1 through Sn. These two to the n states are represented as n bit strings. Let there be a unique state, say SV, that satisfies the condition C of SV equals one, where for all other states, s c of s equals zero assume that for any state s the condition c of s can be evaluated in unit time the problem is to evaluate s v or to identify the state s v so there you go that's the problem we have this function and we want to find b equals w basically so there you go however here you can see the jump grover's algorithm also assumes one can implement an oracle operator such that for states in the computational basis, yada, yada, yada. Okay, that's true um, in some sense. In another sense, uh, the implementation doesn't have to be necessarily gate-based, right? We can say, I'm doing or Grover's algorithm. I have my quantum circuit I set up, and then I have some environmental effect I can induce, which is an Oracle operator. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the gates are. It, who knows you know what the gates are and uh yeah that's my operator some mystery process i can induce you know just as we've seen that uh you know particles from space can uh, induce uh correlated errors on quantum computers uh maybe you know maybe i'm doing something like that you know i have some physical process that i'm doing to the quantum computer that isn't a gate but that's my oracle and so that's where we can begin to see the assumptions exposed. So basically we have an Oracle operator. Remember, we don't have, that doesn't mean we know the gates at all for the Oracle operator. Um, yeah, so we don't know the value W ahead of time, of course. Um, so moving through, this is just Grover's algorithm. You can definitely check out, I walked through this diffusion operator in a previous video. So you can check that out. I'll also link that below. So what they're doing here is basically saying, what we can do is uh, we can construct this uh, UW, which is the Oracle as a matrix product operation, which can be efficiently simulatable. And you'll notice right away, there's an interesting claim. This MPO exists, of course, um, but its construction 
is not necessarily easy since we don't have access to the solutions. Basically, the same thing that a uh, uh, same sort of concept where it's like, well, we have to know something about the problem to be able to make an oracle is the same thing. We have to make, know something about the problem to construct an MPO. Um, but this, this is the assumption right here is that we can construct this MPO, which is not, you know, easy in, in general, because we don't always have the same level of access to this information. Like with S three sad or um, satisfiability problems, we can, we know a lot about the problem, even if we obviously don't have the solution, we can still know a lot about like, okay, here's the, you know, representation and we can convert it and do all that. But if it's some mystery process, then we, we don't have that information. And this is where we can see that Grover's algorithm does not, you know, say, uh, there's an advantage for an Oracle implementation says there's an advantage for an Oracle function, assuming we have some mystery function, right? So we can go through the rest of it. This is just sort of the practical impl implications. You can see the MPS, you can see uh, some simulation times and whatnot, um, not particularly interesting. So what we can see is uh, another, so I've already established sort of like the assumption that we can make an Oracle circuit is not necessarily true and doesn't, isn't implied at all by Grover's algorithm. And the second thing is that proving cases where Grover's algorithm doesn't offer an advantage doesn't mean Grover's algorithm sort of in general doesn't offer an advantage, right? We're not looking like on any, that to use a more understandable example, let's think about sorting algorithms, right? There's a bunch of different sorting algorithms. You have best, worst, and average case performance. Um, <clears throat> on any given list, right? Like my merge sort versus my quick sort versus my, what's the other one? Bogo sort, Pongo sort, what's the really jumping around? Um, like all of these might have different performances. And uh, I think it's Bongo sort, hold on, Bongo sort, is this it? Bogo sort, yeah. This is uh, has an average performance of factorial. Uh, so you can see, right, this is not the best uh, sorting algorithm. And yet, for a given array, this might be more efficient than merge sort because it's it's a random it's a randomized algorithm. Um, and you know, if I if I randomly pick the best you know, the sorted version right there, I, I win. And so this, but this doesn't mean that this is a, the performance is better. This just means on a given problem, the performance is better. And so you can see right here that, you know, we show there's no theoretical advantage unless proven. Otherwise, it has to be decided in a case by case manner. That's not what advantage in a theoretical sense is. A theoretical sense is in general, asymptotic performance given this arbitrary function, like practically, it's a case by case, fan, case by case manner, quantum advantage in a practical sense, sure, but that's trivially true quantum advantage for every problem has to be a case by case manner. Like finding you're know, like, Oh, I could do VQE on this Hamiltonian, like, what if your Hamiltonian is trivially like diagonalizable? Well, like, why would you do VQE? There's definitely no advantage. So all of this is always true, even on Shor's algorithm, right? Like, you know, there can be factorizations that are already known. We don't need to do Schwartz algorithm. We already know the factors. So it is, it is very true that practically quantum advantage has to be decided by case by case manner, but that's already true. That's so, I think that's sort of accepted. Um, but Grover's algorithm in, as an algorithmic, right? We're separating the practical implementations from the algorithmic theory it is still advantageous, right? Uh, this is sort of saying we're, we're scapegoating the calls to the Oracle by efficiently simulating it, but we're bounded, right? It says even above 80 qubits, you can see the scaling even then isn't super good. 80 qubits is all you can get to according to figure one, uh, which is 
clearly not even that unnecessarily efficient, but it, in terms of calls to the Oracle, they mentioned you can do certain things in O of one calls to the Oracle, um, which is sort of not really the case because they're assuming that you already have a bunch of auricular information that you may not have. And so uh, the, basically all, all that I'm trying to say here in summary is that there's a lot of assumptions built in here that are just not universally true when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about these um, theoretical cases. And uh, sort of, this is not just me saying this, I will uh, link below the Cyrate page, you can check out what other people are saying. Uh, feel free to, you know, of course, investigate this to your own interests. Um, And so, yeah, basically, uh, in general, what I'm saying is that this is a, that the idea that Grover's algorithm offers no quantum advantage is untrue in, this, in a theoretical sense. In a practical sense, that's a very different topic and conversation. In general, I think quadratic, I mean, there is that, there's a paper, I'll, let me make a note of linking to this as well. Um, called Beyond Quadratic Quantum something. Basically, that's saying, given the overheads of error correction, quadratic speedups are pretty iffy in terms of meaning being useful for fault tolerant quantum computers. So, you know, practically, is Grover's algorithm going to be useful? I don't know. I don't know. But in a theoretical sense, this is still very true. So um, I'll link below, of course, the paper, the Cyrate, you can see discussions there. There's also, although I generally try to uh, um, um, although I generally try to avoid avoid the uh, the blog, there is a good uh, exchange on Scott Aronson's blog that I will link. There's uh, there's two blogs. One of them is, of course, Grover's algorithm offers a quantum advantage. And the second is uh, responding to one of the author's response. And so, uh, yeah, you can check it out. I will link those below. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, they're basically saying very similar things that um, I'm saying that, like, okay, you can construct problems that, uh, <laughs> maybe are more efficient um, classically, but in general is what we're talking about. And the, the diversion between the Oracle function and the actual matrix is very difficult. And this is sort of well established. But anyway, I don't want to beat this uh, too much. Um, so I will uh, move on from this point and go to the next. Oh, actually, the last thing I'll say is that and this is where I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to the to the authors. But in a in a uh, in a pop science article that I got uh, shared to, or someone shared with me, there's a quote from the the author saying, uh, "Quote: Grover's algorithm gives exactly that. The so-called NP-complete problems, which are a large set of hard problems, can be solved in principle with this algorithm." Um, I'm just going to, you know, give them the benefit of doubt and assume the, the author of this article sort of took it out of context and changed the meaning. But this is, on one sense, trivially true. Yes, Grover's algorithm can solve NP-complete problems, but so in the same sense that classical algorithms can, um, Grover's algorithm does not prove that P equals NP because it's only a quadratic uh, speed up, right? They still scale exponentially, same as classical. So that's not... Like no one's, most people are not saying Grover's algorithm is going to be practically useful on NP-complete problems for, in general, because it's a quadratic improvement. So that that's just something weird too, is I, I'm going to assume that was taken out of context, but that's like no one, Grover's is not NP, like you're not going to just magically solve NP problems with it. So anyway, of course, I'll also link that below. So I guess that was kind of uh, a little less organized than I might have hoped, but basically, uh, yes, Grover's algorithm 
does offer an advantage. This is just a very long, uh, confusing approach to the function versus matrix dilemma that is, to be fair, is very um, confusing and, and I struggled with as well, but uh, probably not the best for people more established in the field. You know, maybe it's more acceptable for me as an undergraduate student to make that mistake. But anyway, moving on, we are going to be talking about the Microsoft research paper, Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence, Early Experiments with GPT-4. Uh, so this is really, uh, really, this is a big deal, right? Artificial general intelligence. That's like, uh, that's some sci-fi stuff right here. Um, now I have actually, I made a video previously critiquing chat GPT before GPT-4 came out. Since GPT-4 has come out, many of my complaints have stand, still stand. And in fact, I have actually used GPT-4, um, so I, I'm not just basing this on other people's prompts. I've submitted my own. Uh, yes, it, it d does cost money. Um, and the important thing to note <laughs> is that uh, I changed the title actually of the previous video to say a lot of them still stand. One of the things I was, this is just a funny anecdote, but I was working with GPT-4 and I was trying to get it to generate sort of this um, this code basically, but I'm saying I, I want this code. I want to copy and and paste it into like, I just want to, you know, copy and paste it. I don't want to have to like reformat this in any way. Um, but it would randomly put like string, like uh, the string of JSON, like a JSON object, but the words J S O N inside of the code. And I would tell it time and time again, like, don't do that. If you're submitting something that has JSON in it, you're wrong. Like, uh, there is literally no way to get it to not put JSON in there on any like regularity that I just gave up, and uh, <laughs> I would just remove it by hand. And so that that's a funny story that like it's very bad sometimes. But that doesn't mean it's not generally intelligent. I am also bad at things. So uh, without further ado, let's get into this uh, discussion of why this is kind of a, a bit, you know, ambitious, much like the previous paper. Uh, the previous paper I have definitely read more thoroughly. It is 16 pages. It is not that hard to read. I have, uh, I have actually read the paper. This paper is 155 pages. I have read some of it, but not all of it. And you might say, how can you critique something that you have not read all of? And the answer is twofold. Uh, on one hand, uh, I can the, the basic premise is outlined and I read, you know, the first, you know, introduction, 20 pages, the conclusion and, and that, and the rest is sort of filled with the specific examples. So I feel like that the thesis is what I'm criticizing, not the specifics. And the second is because uh, it's a common technique, actually. Um, if you go, you know, I, I did, you know, a debate way back in high school. And if you do that too, you'll be familiar that, uh, just saying a lot of information is a technique. People call it different things it's called fire hosing, gish kebab. There's all these terms for it, but uh, that is just designed to make it hard to respond to, right? Like if I wrote a 2000 page response to this and you're like, you're so you, you, I can't have the expectation that the only people can, that can critique it are the people that read it because it's so long. Like nobody's going to be able to read it reasonably. So, I'm just going to win every argument because I can just say more. So like, just because it's so long, like I don't have to read all of this to, you know, I guess share, share thoughts on it because that's sort of buying into this idea that I have to respond to every single point in excruciating detail, which would then incentivize them, you know, next time they come out with a 300 page paper. Like I'm not spending years of my life just to, <laughs> read this this work so anyway of course you can always say you're a fool owen why would you ever think that and i disagree with you and exit out of the video right now and i would not blame you so without further ado uh, let's uh let's get into it so basically the idea here is gpt4 shows sparks of artificial intelligence now your first question as mine was is what the hell does sparks mean 
Sparks is not a technical term. Sparks is not really a philosophical term. <laughs> so what the hell does that mean? And there's not a great answer, but basically, uh, so GPT-4 is good at a lot of things, is basically the TLDR of this paper. Um, it's human level performance, sometimes better at many different tasks. Uh, and that's sort of true. I'm not, I think there's a lot of specifics you could get into. For example, there was people who looked at like the math evaluation of GP, chat, GPT-4 and then so there's like math Olympiad problems or whatever, and it did it super well on them. They're like, oh, that's really good at math. But then they fed it next year's and it did terribly. That hadn't been published yet. So people are like, hmm, maybe this year's was on the training data and or the previous year's was in the training data. So just, you know, testing on the training data, of course, it's going to do well. And it just completely bombed the next year's because it doesn't actually understand math. But uh, um, that's neither here nor there. I'm just going to accept at face value that it's good at a lot of things, even though I feel like there's definitely room for critique there. But, you know, even if it is, let's 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 move on. So you can see very long. Um, the first thing, of course, that I'm going to be asking, this is nine times out of 10, people often uh, talk about AI and AGI especially. Um I often sort of get into conversations about it because I did obviously get a degree in philosophy. And so, uh, but it's, it's often not in, <laughs> I often don't really like these conversations because I don't think they're productive. And so the question I always ask that uh, can often uh, <laughs> solve these discussions is what is general intelligence? Very few people who go into discussions of AGI have a good definition of it. And there are arguments that a definition isn't required, only a definition of what sort of the tests are in some sense, right? Like, I don't have to know what general intelligence is. I just have to be able to identify it. And that's a different, that's a different argument, though. But here you can see that my first question, of course, is what is general intelligence to the authors here? Um, and that is... Um, you can see that they say, you know, general intelligence is sort of broad as opposed to narrow intelligence. So they use artificial general intelligence to demonstrate our systems. So what is an AGI? Systems that demonstrate broad capabilities of intelligence. Okay, well, that's pretty meaningless. That's just the general intelligence part. So what is intelligence? Reasoning, planning, and the ability to learn with experience with these capabilities at or above human level. So right off the bat, that's the definition. Intelligence is reasoning, planning, and learning from experience. Now, of course, uh, the philosopher would always ask, well, what is reasoning? <laughs> what is planning? And what is learning? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's uh, not so trivial either. Like, what is reasoning? What does that mean? Like, we all have, there's, that's not necessarily any easier to... Uh, <laughs> To define, but but I'll accept this de uh, definition at face value. Um, but the only question is sort of um, like, what's um, what are they going to do to show this? And we'll, we'll move on and, and see that. I sort of forgot what I was going to say in that sentence. But basically, uh, reasoning, planning, learning. The first thing, of course, is that. Learning from experience, in some sense, is not what GPT-4 does. It's a static model that they hand you. Um, it, it can learn sort of from prompting, but uh, that I would argue that's not really learning, uh, like the interactive component, right? Because it's not learning. Nothing's changing. It's simply you're sort of... So if you say like what's two plus two and it responds five and you're like actually two plus two is four right in your chat interface and it's like oh sorry and you say what's two plus two and it says four you're like oh it learned but no because what you're doing is effectively submitting all of the previous information in one right like that's the context window that's the whole prompt basically is it includes the previous information and so that the cap is however many tokens like eight thousand tokens or something but uh so it's it's as if you submitted the first parts with the 
with the latter. So if I say, you know, what's um, two plus two and it now says four, I'm like, oh, it learned. But if I said, if I copied and pasted the first part that said what's two plus two, it's five and, and put that at the beginning, like I wanna say it's learning uh, from that. It's just recognizing that it's not, nothing's changing about it. It either already knew or didn't know how to respond to that prompt. And so uh, I would say prompting in, in that context window definitely does not say learning from experience. Now you might be able to say, oh, I can fine tune it to learn from experience, which is fair, but you can fine tune everything. That is not, <laughs> that is a weak, uh, I think, argument because I can fine tune my MNIST classifier uh, and it can learn from experience if that's your definition of learning from experience. So it's either GPT-4 either doesn't meet the learning from experience requirement or the learning from experience requirement is so broad that every ML system meets it. So it's kind of meaningless anyway. Um, so anyway, moving on, uh, whatever, a bunch of stuff that they say here. Uh, and there's some prompts, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and you can see that, of course, they acknowledge my point here that uh, planning uh, is debatable and it's missing learning from experience, as I said. Uh, so how do we uh, study its reasoning, planning, and ability to learn from experience? Uh, well, the standard approach, of course, is to uh, evaluate the generalization of a model by sort of taking your test set and using that as a proxy for the true generalization. And so you can say, okay, it's not just memorizing my data set, which is especially potent in deep learning. Um, it's actually able to generalize somewhat. And this generalization is, is sort of, I guess you could say true learning. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's a good framework. However, uh, <laughs> we don't have access to the full data set. Uh, somewhat ironically, OpenAI, ironically, since its name is open, um, did not make the training data set open. So we have no idea what it is trained in. And so that's sort of like my first, I guess it maybe it's a cheap argument, but uh, whenever se someone says, you know, this is, wow, look at this, you know, that it did, it's so new and, and novel. Like I'm gonna argue, actually that was in the training data set. Like can't, we can't prove that one way or another. So I can just say that and, and like, we don't know, right? So if they're saying like, here's the prompt is that, can you write a proof that there are infinitely many primes with every line that rhymes? And here's the outcome. Uh, one, there's a weird period S right there. Um, but the other thing is you cannot say that this prompt and this answer was not in the data set. That, that is not a claim that you can make. That's not a claim that I can make. That's not a claim that the authors of Microsoft research can make. So it's it's sort of, a, to me, it's sort of a, a weird effort to even be doing because who knows, this could have been in the data set. We don't know what the data set is. And, and I'm operating under the assumption that everything is in the data set unless there's some evidence otherwise. Um, and that's sort of like the skeptics approach, which I get, I think is, is a good approach, right? Draw a unicorn and, and Tech Z, I don't know how to say this. It's a latex package. Um, you know, I don't know if that's in the training data set. All of this could be for all we know. We we literally don't know. So that's that's part of my problem, but uh whatever. And the second is that um this sort of generality is beyond the typical scope of narrow AI systems. And this is where there's a question here. Um, and that is GPT-4, multimodal or not, is not fundamentally different than other ML systems. Uh, and what do I mean by that is it's uh, a set of linear and nonlinear operations being conducted on GPUs, trained on a specific loss function, updated with backpropagation. That's every machine learning model. So why is this different? And the reason is because it's good at a lot of things. But that's sort of a deceptive almost comment because it's good at a lot of things, but what was it actually trained on, right? Well, uh, these sort of models are was auto regressive, right? So you just, if I have like a, I can do a little 
picture maybe to help maybe clarify this auto regressive network. Um, wow, these are all terrible diagrams. Uh, auto regressive. This is why uh, no one uses Bing. Uh, but I guess here we go. This is a good one. You can see sort of that this uh, the auto regressive nature is sort of like that. This okay, never mind. But basically, that just means you're predicting the next um, output based on the previous uh, inputs and outputs. Maybe I can just search. Um, wow, these are. I, I normally don't use Bing, and so I'm just doing this in Microsoft Edge. So I, I'm always amused by how terrible Bing is at searching things. So I will instead go to auto regressive neural. There we go. This is good. Okay, these are actually all terrible. Ah, here we go. This is this is a perfect example I want to see. So you have this input, right? That's all of these previous ones are being used, and then the output you can see it moves to the beginning or to the end of the input, and you put the output back into the input. So that's sort of auto regressive, right? Is you're predicting the next step based off of the previous ones, um, right there. So what is GPT doing? It takes tokens. Well, I don't know exactly how it's tokenizing them, but it, basically I'm going to think of it just as a byte of information. It could be a Unicode character. It could be a string, a number, whatever. And it predicts based off of a sequence of bytes, the next one. Now that doesn't seem any particularly wider than previous sort of systems. There's lots of auto regressive models. The concept of a byte maybe is a little wider, but it performs on tasks beyond what we think of as narrow AI symptoms because it's trained on tasks beyond the scope of narrow AI systems. All of language modeling, right? The autoregressive language models um, and previous language models such as GPT-2 and 3 and all the other chinchilla, palm, whatever else there are, um, all of them are doing effectively the same thing. Um, so this isn't GPT-4 is in a difference um, really in type. Uh, it's more a difference uh, in implementation details. So it doesn't seem to me that it's really broader. It's just better. Um, and so any, I think any uh, arguments you make that these autoregressive language models, any given one exhibits sparks of artificial general intelligence, you have to say they all do. They might be very weak sparks, but they're doing the same thing. It's just one's bigger. Now you could reject that uh, if you argue there's some sort of emergent phenomenon, um, and that's something we will get into shortly. But uh, that's that's sort of a common I, I thought I have on this is that like it's not any wider. It's training to do the exact same thing. It's just better at it. Um, so you can see they give some examples here. Um, you know, whatever it could be hired as a software engineer. You know, go for it. Uh, but the uh, key question, right, from a uh, I guess philosophical sense, is even if it was perfect, and it's really not that perfect, it struggles at a lot of basic tasks. Does it truly understand these concepts? Or is it just generating the next byte? And so that's sort of, um, I mean, that's a, a very age old philosophy question. Um, that shows up everywhere, not just in artificial intelligence, but um, in sort of metaphysics, theories of mind. Um, that is something simulation or is it reality? And if the simulation is indistinguishable from the reality, is it effectively the same thing? So if I have, um, this is related to the concept of uh, philosophical zombies, philosophical zombie. Um, 
So basically, you have a normal person uh, that reacts sort of as people uh, would, but do not have a conscious experience. So they're not, we wouldn't really call them, I don't know, maybe you would call them people, maybe you wouldn't, but you know, it, it has the same physical capabilities. It just isn't, uh, it's a simulation almost in essence. And so this question of does GPT understand what it's saying or typing, or is it just typing? That's sort of, I mean, that's a very philosophical question right there. And I, I don't think I've uh, met many people that say it really understands it because how could it understand anything really? Like conceptually, like map moles on GPUs don't seem like capable of understanding things. Um, and if it is, and it does understand what it's saying, then maybe, <laughs> maybe we're treating it poorly by turning it off that doesn't, maybe that's not even ethical but uh um that what they say is rather than trying to avoid that question is they say can one reasonably say that a system that passes exams for software engineering is not really intelligent i'll say two things on that first is that i've met a lot of not really intelligent software engineers so uh <laughs> I, I think i can't say that um and the second thing is that I don't think software engineering is sort of the pinnacle testing point for intelligence. In fact, uh, I think a lot of people are opposed to software engineering candidate exams. Um, and they mentioned that perhaps only real test is the production of new knowledge, which is perhaps a more common ex you know, approach to intelligence, which remains out of reach for LLMs. So they, they don't really answer this question, which is fine. Um, but from here on out, you can see in the following sections, what they're going to be doing is just, um, do I have this? Yeah, you can see just, so this is what it can do. It can code, it can do math, it can talk to people, it can um, do all sorts of discriminative capabilities. So there's lots of stuff it can do, right? That's basically the rest of the paper. And so the question that it comes down to, to me, is that is there, um, is predicting the next bit or byte of a sentence or of a, I guess, string of bytes would be more accurate, all there is to intelligence. And, uh, the question is maybe not so easily answered, uh, but there's certainly a lot to it that seems um, to be very different than what's being indicated here. So basically, if intelligence is just predicting the next byte of information, then perhaps GPT-4 is really intelligent. but that's very different than what we describe intelligence in humans um, because intelligence in humans often has some sort of uh, implicit understanding involved. So it's not uh, intelligence requires an understanding uh, in, in many, uh, you know, I guess perspectives and opinions. So if, if I don't understand anything, but I happen to guess everything correctly, right? Like I say, I, I walk into, you know, um, a Korean restaurant and, uh, I don't speak Korean, but I happen to guess all of the words correctly. I pull out random sounds of my mouth and it just so happens I string together a perfectly coherent Korean sentence. And that happens for a whole discussion. And then they're like, wow. That person's, you know, really good at Korean, like, except I'm not, I just happen to get it right. And even if I happen to get it right every time, I, I still don't understand Korean, I still don't know Korean. So people want to say I'm an intelligent or I'm smart at the Korean language. So you can just see how this uh, um, 
sort of a distinction between the sort of understanding that's uh, implicit in a lot of discussions of human knowledge and the um, discussions of intelligence with GPT-4 and LLMs. All this is to say, and I'll just summarize this, that uh, if there's sparks of artificial general intelligence with GPT-4, there's sparks in every um, GPT model because as we can see, this is the same sort of thing, um, training aug large autoregressive models. Okay, adding one more transformer layer doesn't seem to do much unless there's at some point some sort of emergent phenomenon. That's where if I can find it. You can see they say that it does exhibit emergent behaviors. Now emergence, this one is a very philosophically weighted uh, word. I'll put a discussion of emergence down in the, uh, of course, description. Um, and arguing that something exhibits emergent behavior is, uh, shall I say, not easy to do. Uh, in the sense that people are still arguing whether the human mind is even emergent. And I have full understanding, I guess, of what it is like to be a human because, you know, I am one. We all are. Uh -huh. So it's like, even with fully sort of transparent cases where we have full access to the physics of it, even if we don't understand, obviously, everything going on in the brain, we still haven't decided if it's emergent. So arguing that this is emergent doesn't seem any easier. And of course, you can see from the um, control find here that they never mentioned the concept of emergence again. You can see uh, that's the only other um, no effective. Uh, there's not really a discussion of emergence. There's just a few notes on it. Um, so this is sort of just stated without any uh, support that these behaviors are emergent. And so that's that's a big, you know, claim because that's what separates. That would be what separates us at, at a certain point, right? That these behaviors and skills um, uh, sort of are beyond the micro parts of the system, beyond just a combination of those parts, um, which would be a very large, <laughs> deal a lot of implication to that but very little of this work is uh, dedicated to that and so we can see that even uh if you're sort of rejecting all i've said before you know whatever you know buy this understanding thing i don't care about understanding i don't care about emergence uh this is really good at doing a lot of stuff it's still the same problem that it's not really good at doing a lot of stuff. It's really good at doing one thing. GPT-4 is not doing medicine, law, psychology, coding, vision, mathematics. GPT-4 is predicting the next byte, the next token based on input tokens. Now you might say that's all there is to intelligence, in which case, okay. Uh, but I think a lot of people hold that there's more uh, to intelligence than just that. I. You know, and that that's your welcome to uh, welcome to have your own thoughts on that. But um, the last thing I'll say is that uh, I said this in my I think it was in my NISC video, uh, trials and tribulations of NISC. I want to say is that you should always look at the who's saying something and why they might be saying something. In other words, follow the money. Uh, and if you're curious, uh, you should look, if you don't know anything about Microsoft and OpenAI, maybe look at uh, the financial ties there. Maybe Microsoft has, you know, some financial, substantial financial interests. Maybe they have some large percent stake in open AI. Maybe they don't, you know? Uh, so maybe they have an interest, you know, in hyping up GPT-4. I don't know. But uh, all that is to say, uh, follow the money. I realize now that I said all that is to say like five times in this video, so I apologize. I also said um a lot, so I also apologize for that. And um, I hope that this at least brought 
some discussions uh, to mind about uh, how sort of easy it is to hype up uh, especially popular science and how clickbait titles can get a lot more attention than sort of genuine research. I'll also note that this that there's a talk that goes with this paper that has, at least at the last time I checked, more than a million views on YouTube. And uh, so this is clearly like, people have read this paper a lot, people have talked about it. I saw, unfortunately, I try to also, <laughs> much like I said, I would try to avoid blogs, especially Aronson's blog. I also try to avoid um, that crap on LinkedIn, but uh, inevitably I saw people um, you know, this has reached everywhere on LinkedIn, everybody, VCs, everybody's talking about artificial general intelligence. Um, so it's very widespread. And I would encourage people to look more deeply, not only at financial connections, uh, but also of look also at the actual evidence presented before them, and think about what intelligence actually is. And in conclusion, I will say uh, two things. The first is that, to me, I'm sort of always a skeptic. I'm skeptical of all this AGI stuff, because I'm not, you might say, how can we test for AGI, right? That's that's what this paper is sort of focused on, is testing for it. And I, I reject all of these tests. You might say, how can you reject all of them? That's absurd. And it is because I'm an absurd person, but also because I don't know, I cannot think of any, or I have not found any test for general intelligence that I believe in. So you might say, well, how do you know other people are intelligent or have any capacities for, you know, reasoning or planning? And the only, the, the, the answer there is basically that I think maybe people, like I am a person, so I know what it's like to be, you know, the subjective experience of being a person I'm familiar with. And since other people are genotypically, phenotypically, morphologically, physiologically similar to me, I can imagine that they are similar in uh, capacities and that if they pass all the tests, then I have reason to believe that they have the same sort of experience that I do simply because of the similarities in their processing systems. But when something radically different, such as map moles comes along, even if it passes all the same tests that you could give to a human, would you really believe it's intelligent? Because you know, this is the same metaphysical question of what is it like to be GPT-4 or uh, what is to, to reminisce uh, to the famous paper, what is it like to be a bat? That, that uh, metaphysical question might be outside of our capacity to answer. Um, but if it is outside of our capacity to answer, then I think our hopes of uh, determining general intelligence are probably limited or artificial general intelligence are probably limited. The second thing I'll say, um, I don't actually remember what I was going to say. So maybe I will just finish here. Let me just check to make sure there is nothing else. Oh, I think that's it. And the last thing I'll say is that with all closed AI endeavors. So closed AI being anything that I can't sort of investigate by, um, right? I mean, for all I know, like, there is no GPT-4. Like, for all we know, there's a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of, you know, uh, people, uh, Sam Altman has kidnapped and chained to a desk that are responding to all of our prompts. So, <laughs> I mean, like, we, we don't know anything. So, evaluating these systems is impossible, maybe a priori, maybe we can never evaluate them, but it's certainly impossible if we have no access to what they were trained on or what they actually look like. So that's the last thing I'll say is that this sparks of AGI, I do not see any sparks, I do not see general intelligence, and uh, I don't think uh, most people would be willing to 
give sparks of AGI to uh, previous GPT models. So I don't really see how you could give it to this one without a detailed sort of explanation of emergent behaviors, which is not given here. So that's the last thing I'll say. Um, of course, as usual, uh, as I've expressed before, I, I rather dislike um, making these sort of videos. I don't, you know, talking about things. I I don't have anything, you know, worthwhile to say. And, and um, well, neither do these people. And uh, if I if I'm being honest, so um, I'm just gonna sort of end it here. And of course, since I don't like making these videos, and I would encourage you not to watch them. That's a, perhaps a weird thing to say, but you know, don't watch the video, go read the paper and make your own opinion, you know, uh, and make sure to check financial ties. Of course, uh, I uh, will upload a, a actual technical, um, video as well with this, uh, the balance, at least for my own mental well being, the, the two, uh, you know, the two challenges. Uh, as always, uh, I think that is it. And yes, I know there was not a script and uh, this was, you know, a rambling mess. And because I already know that, I once again do not feel inclined to turn on the comments for this video because I do not believe there will be any fruitful discussion in them.